very strong in, in grace. And he says, Carl, uh, I'm going to be visiting with other uh, family members, and they've invited me to midnight mass. He says, should I go? And boy, we started a conversation. And uh, my first knee-jerk reaction was, now there's the doctrine of separation, right? Uh, to stay away from, we don't need that. Yet yeah, you don't gain anything from going. But then I, we talked and he says, well, I'm going to alienate my family. I'll be at the house while they're all at midnight mass. And I says, why don't, maybe you could use this to uh, further um, your foothold of grace in their life, or God's foothold. And uh, so we, we discussed it, and we decided that maybe if you go, don't participate in anything, just be there. And then after the fact, when you're having coffee afterwards, ask them, why did he do this, or why do you call him a priest, or ask them why everything and make them think about what they're doing rather than just going through the motions. Anyone here was Catholic at your... Okay, very good. How about Baptists? We have some Baptists here in Pentecostals. No, come on, we've got to get some Pentecostals in here. <laughs> <laughs> but the, uh, the idea is uh, to help him help his family was the main reason for what I've done here uh, for this morning. I, I wrote him a page, you know, when you start discussing some doctrines, it starts out with, yeah, do this. Here's a verse in Corinthians. You can use this verse. Well, this verse goes with it, too. And then so you have 12 pages later. I, <laughs> I emailed, emailed it to him, and I says, this isn't, is not exhaustive, but we, which leaves the door open for us to keep communicating and the main idea is to help someone get out of the bondage of religion or uh, Matthew, Mark, or wait a minute, it's Mama Lou John. And I'm not talking in tongues. You see the sign up there? What is that? Luke and John. See that? I couldn't pull the wool over your eyes. That's, uh, that's very good. But the, uh, uh, the study is a result of that call. You're in... Uh, you're in Matthew chapter 5, right? Okay. Matthew 5. The, the idea is that the denominations that we talked about earlier or that you know of or that you hear on the radio or TV or your friends or family, most teachings come from where? Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, the four Gospels. And uh, so that's where what I wanted to do was what's basically taught. I don't want to get extensive, but because I don't have time, to see what's exactly there and think about what's there and should we be doing that today. Um, Matthew 5 in verse uh, 17. Christ speaking, of course. Uh, Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I'm not come to destroy but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass not one Jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. And whosoever therefore shall break one of these least commandments shall teach and shall teach men so he shall be called least in the kingdom of heaven. But whosoever shall do and teach them, the same shall be called great in the kingdom of heaven. For I say unto you that except your righteousness shall exceed the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall in no case enter into the kingdom of heaven. Let's stop there for a moment. And so he's, Christ is saying, if there's the law and the commandments, he says, do and teach them. So Jesus Christ is, is commending or approving the use of the law. Is that correct? Yes. Okay, so the law is certainly, in effect, in Christ's day. So if I go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, we remember friends that we know or people that we talk to daily or weekly or on Christmas time that the book of Matthew is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John are all talking about the law. That's what Christ taught. We're going to kind of blend everything together. We'll make some, a list of some things and then we'll show reasons for why those are up there. Um, uh, 
uh, Romans chapter 9. We're going to go back to Matthew, uh, and uh, so we'll be back there later if you have a marker. Romans chapter 9. And in Romans 9 is Paul talking about the, the Jew, that God is not done with the Jew, even though grace has started in Paul's day. But I, wanna, I want to compare Matthew chapter 5 and Romans chapter 9. It says in verse 31, But Israel, which followed after the law of righteousness hath not attained to the law of righteousness. We just read Matthew chapter 5 that except your righteousness exceeds the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees, you shall no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. Um, and so it says in verse Romans 9.32, Wherefore? Because they sought it not by faith. But as it were written, the works of the law, for they stumbled at that stumbling stone. What they did is they were, except, except your righteousness except, exceeds the law, the, the scribes and the Pharisees, you shall in no wise enter into the kingdom of heaven. So what, if I'm following Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John in my lifetime to attain to heaven, as they have it here, the kingdom of heaven, what do I have to exceed? What were they doing? What scribes and Pharisees they were teaching the people what to do. They were commanding people what to do, but were they doing it? No, their heart was not in it. Their faith was not in it. And so that's why they stumbled. They stumbled at Christ, actually. Uh, Romans chapter 10, and verse 10, a verse that is commonly uh, thrown around uh, today. For with the heart man believeth unto righteousness, and with the mouth confession is made unto salvation. You might see this in an awful lot of tracts that uh, even grace believers pass out today. With that heart, Paul is talking about the nation of Israel here in Romans chapter 10. And he says, God's not done with them, but with the heart man believeth. What's missing in Matthew chapter 5 when he's talking the Sermon on the Mount is Israel's heart. He's after their heart, not the doing of things, not the traditions and ceremonies that they all got caught up in. Uh, Romans chapter 3, back up a little bit. If I ever have trouble understanding some doctrine about salvation or uh, where we're at today, the book of Romans chapter 3 usually clears it up. And if you don't, uh, if you've never uh, read or studied that, get a dictionary of the gospel back there and uh, take that home, buy it. And uh, it's, <laughs> it's, it's a good uh, book that stems out of Romans 3. And I thank Brother Tom, Pastor Tom, for uh, taking the time to put that together. And it says in Romans 3, verse 20, it says, Therefore, by the deeds of the law, there shall no flesh be justified in a sight, for by the law is the knowledge of sin. Law tells us what sin is. So what did we determine already that Matthew chapter 5 taught? Christ taught himself. What did, he, what did he affirm? Do the law and teach the law. So here in Romans it says, By the works of the law shall no flesh be justified. Well, that's different, isn't it? And so if you've... Maybe this is the first time you've heard anything about there's a difference in Scripture. And maybe uh, instead of some of us have been here for a while and we understand a little bit about this. And this will help reinforce what, we're, what we should be doing with uh, people out there. I know Brother Jim's out there teaching uh, constantly in, in, the, uh, in the face of uh, Catholicism and uh, whatever else is out there in those... Uh, those uh, senior homes, etc., and the mission. But the, the idea is to help someone. And it's not to take a holy baseball bat and say, you guys are really just messed up. That's easy to say, isn't it? It's, sometimes we get a big head with, uh, with grace. That's a good message, isn't it? <laughs> but the, uh, uh, back to uh, Romans chapter 3. The law is the knowledge of sin. Romans 3.21, but now, 
The righteousness of God without the law is manifest, being witnessed by the law and the prophets. The righteousness of God without the law. Now, is that different from having your righteousness exceed the, right, the righteousness of the scribes and Pharisees? Is that different? Okay. Everyone's in agreement. That's right. Back in Matthew, turn back to Matthew chapter 13. There's a righteousness that was in the law. And we'll leave it back there. And under grace, it's the righteousness, I'll put R up there, of Christ. Matthew chapter 13, verse 15. And it says there, For this people's heart is waxed gross, and their ears are dull of hearing. And their eyes they have closed, lest at any time they should see with their eyes and hear with their ears, and should understand with their heart, and should be converted, and I shall heal them. Heart. Is this the heart God's talking about in Matthew? No, let's go here, huh? Let's go here in a spiritual heart, a desire to understand why they're, why they're um, listening uh, to this man, Jesus Christ. All day long, I have stretched out my hands to a disobedient and gainsaying people. They didn't want him. They wanted what they could gain from being in their ministry. They would uh, sit at, what was it, the long robes, and they would do this in the streets, and people would look at them. And they, would, they wanted to do according to their traditions, and they would take the law and tweak it to their, to their benefit. And so we have to watch what being taught in the law, what's actually being taught here, and how it's misused. Um, Matthew 15, verse 8. It says there, this people draweth nigh unto me with their mouth, and honoreth me with their lips, but their heart is far from me. The heart is gone. They're honoring him with their lips. That's ceremony of what we call lip service. And so that's, that's part of the heart issue. We could go on with that, but we're not going to. Let's, let's move in. Um, back to Matthew chapter 8. There's two places in Matthew that if I meet someone that is steeped or convinced that they need to be in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, uh, have been taught that all their life and don't want to depart that, I would go to two places in the book of Matthew. One would be chapter 8, the other one would be chapter 23. And we'll touch on both of them. If we take our doctrine from Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, Matthew 8.1, it says, when he was come down, that's Christ, from the mountain, great multitudes followed him. And behold, there came a leper and worshipped him, saying, Lord, if thou wilt, thou canst make me clean. And Jesus put forth his hand and touched him, saying, I will be thou clean. And immediately his leprosy was cleansed. And Jesus saith unto him, See thou tell no man, but go thy way, show thyself to the priest, and offer the gift that Moses commanded for a testimony unto them. Okay, what do we gain from this? Offer the gift that Moses... So what would that be? According to the Mosaic Law, right? Was that given to the nations or was that given to one nation? To Israel only. We're, we'll, we may not get there, but... That's one of the factors there in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John also. But I'll expound on that if I have time. And so Matthew chapter 8, um, it's the uh, healing is still in effect. I don't have that. Oh, yeah. Healing's up there. The healing ministry is still in effect at this time. And if we follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John... We would have to go, we would have to have an uh, ordained priesthood. We would have to have the law of Moses current. And we would have to, uh, there would be a, a temple involved there too. That might be in my next illustration. So we have a healing of leprosy. Okay, let's get real. 
I went online and I looked up leprosy. And I, I'm thinking, well, that must be a biblical thing. We've probably got that all covered by now, right? No. There are, let me read it so that I, I it says leprosy still exists in 127 countries today. Now, I took this off the internet and I check it by more than one site so I don't just get duped into one site. Information coming from the internet is not always correct. And uh, it says that there's 100 cases per year in America. But the, the worst uh, place is India that has 66% uh, of all leprosy today in India. And it's some of the uh, pictures and stuff was not very pretty. But the, the idea, leprosy in, in scripture is uh, typical of being taught as sin. And so it's something that corrupts and degenerates. But if we're to follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, and we heal a leper, a leper is healed, and I went online again, and looked up healing ministry for leprosy. You'll find them. And so there are people out there that believe if they pray and read the verses that that person will get healed. Only difference is that once the person is cleansed, then they go to the priest. So they got things backwards a little bit. But the verses in Matthew chapter 8 are taken from the Old Testament of Leviticus. And if you go there with me, chapter 14, Leviticus 14, uh, and thereabouts, you'll find an awful lot about leprosy. And uh, about leprosy that's in a house, leprosy that's in your clothes, leprosy that's in your skin, and how to tell whether it's leprosy, and what to do once you've been cleansed. Leviticus chapter 14, verse 2. Uh, 14.2, uh, let's see, here it is, and it says, this shall be the law of the leper in the day that of his cleansing. He shall be brought unto the priest, and the priest shall go forth out of the camp, and the priest shall look, and behold, if the plague of leprosy be healed in the leper, then shall the priest command to take for him that is to be cleansed two birds alive and clean, and cedar wood and scarlet, scarlet and hyssop. And the priest shall command that one of the birds be killed in an earthen vessel over running water. As for the living bird, he shall take it and the cedar wood and the scarlet and the hyssop and shall dip them and the living bird in the blood and the bird, the blood of the bird that was killed over the running water. And, it shall, and he shall sprinkle upon him that is to be cleansed from the leprosy seven times and shall pronounce him clean and shall let the living bird loose in an open field, and so on. Um, but there is a lot of things going on here. There's cleansing, there's um, the healing thing, what we talked about, taken from the Old Testament, from the law of Moses. And we have, here is animal sacrifice. Okay? So Christ is approving of this to be done in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. So, again, if we're going to go back to Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John for our doctrine and, and walking orders for today, we need to follow this. Number one, leprosy still exists, right? And people that don't understand where they are in God's program, if they're still putting themselves under the law here, there's a verse. There's a lot of verses. And it says, oh, Matthew chapter 10. It's where you're holding your place, of course. A lot of stuff going on in Matthew 10. In verse 5, these 12, the 12 apostles, Jesus sent forth and commanded them, saying, Go not into the way of the Gentiles. So the ministry is still to Israel only at this point. And, and into any city of the Samaritans entering not, but rather go to the lost sheep of the house of Israel. 
and as ye go, preach, saying, the kingdom of heaven's at hand. That's that gospel they, they taught there. 10.8, it says, heal the sick, cleanse the lepers, raise the dead, cast out devils, freely receive, freely give. Well, go on about it. If you really believe God's word, it says here, go cleanse the lepers. What are you still sitting here for? There's lepers out there. There's lepers in America. There's le lepers all over the world. So if I'm to follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, I need to get busy here. I need to do something about this. Or I could rightly divide and go home and watch TV. <laughs> but uh, no, that wasn't right. <laughs> go home and study my Bible. Provide neither gold, verse 9, provide neither gold nor silver nor brass in your purses, nor scrip for your journey, nor two coats, uh, neither shoes nor staves, for the workman is worthy of his meat. And so you go out to Israel only, healing, casting out devils, raising the dead. Don't bring any money or, or extra coats. Don't bring a suitcase. And so this is an extreme part of what Christ is teaching the nation Israel on what they're supposed to be doing in, with their ministry. And we can't follow that, can we? Even if, I mean, even if someone didn't know anything about the Bible, what would they say about if I was going to tell them we we're going to offer an animal sacrifice at our church tomorrow? You're satanic, right? Yeah. First thing come to my mind, yeah. go get a chicken somewhere or a cat. Sorry, Judy. <laughs> Not our cats, no. But Christ commanded animal sacrifice. We can't do that. Luke chapter 2. Luke 2, the birth of Christ. Jesus Christ, our Savior. Luke 2, verse 21, and it says, And when eight days were accomplished for, his, for the circumcising of the child, his name was called Jesus, which was so named of the angel before he was conceived in the womb. And when the days of her purification, according to the law of Moses, were accomplished, they brought him to Jerusalem to pre present him to the Lord. As it is written in the law of the Lord, every male that openeth the womb shall be called holy to the Lord, and to offer a sacrifice according to that which is said in the law of the Lord, a pair of turtle doves or two young pigeons. So now, we have a woman giving birth. This uh, unique uh, situation, Mary with Jesus Christ, of course. And he was, where's my blue marker? He was circumcised and not just for physical reasons but for uh, spiritual reasons that's according to the promise uh, uh, given to Abraham uh, in Genesis 17 11 12 right in there and if your child wasn't circumcised you were cut off from the nation of Israel cut off from spiritual blessings circumcision was not just a suggestion it was needed for the nation of Israel to uh, be able to proceed with the nation, to be blessed. And so uh, he was circumcised, and now he needed to offer, she needed to have offered two turtle doves or two young pigeons. Oh, let's go back to Leviticus and see what the Lord is talking about here. See what the scriptures are talking about. Leviticus chapter 12. Leviticus 12. In verse 6, talking about a, a woman giving birth. And when the days of her purifying are fulfilled for a son or for a daughter, she shall bring a lamb of the first year for a burnt offering and a young pigeon or turtle dove for a sin offering unto the door of the tabernacle of the congregation unto the priest. So you need a lamb or a... Uh, uh, pigeon, a turtle dove, 
and it's going to be for a sin offering. You're going to need the tabernacle, and you're going to need a priest to perform the ceremony. If we follow Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Jeez, ladies, anyone here recently brought two turtle doves to the altar or to the tabernacle with a Jewish priest and kill one of them? We're not there yet. Let's look. Um, Leviticus 12, 8. And if she be not able to bring a lamb, then she shall bring two turtles or two young pigeons, the one for the burnt offering and the other for a sin offering, and the priest shall make an atonement for her, and she shall be clean. And so she would have needed to have a burnt offering after she had the child. Anyone here take part of that? No. Even when you were back studying under Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? That's unheard of, isn't it? People don't, you don't touch on that stuff. People don't, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, they're going to pick and choose. I'm not beating anyone up. I'm just telling you the truth. If you're going to follow something, follow it. If not, it, what does the Bible say in Romans? It says if it's either grace or it's works. And it's, I'll read the verse because I can never memorize that one verse. But it's, it's I'll get it. Um, this is Sunday school, right? Your mission for next week, memorize Romans 6. 11.6. And it says there, Romans 11.6, And if by grace, then it is no more of works. It's one or the other. Otherwise, grace is no more grace. If you mix works into grace, it's not grace anymore. You've just spoiled grace. It's not grace. But if it be of works, then it is no more grace. Otherwise, work is no more work. If you're here under the law, doing the things of the law, there's no grace. But if you're over here on grace and you try to interject this into grace, you nullify grace. So let's let the Lord bless us with everything just by faith in Christ. Uh, instead of doing all this here, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, it was necessary for the nation of Israel to listen and do whatever Christ said through the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And take nothing away from it, only understand the audience that he was talking to, the reason why he was giving that, and the doctrine that was taught. And we can certainly gain principles out of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John, can't we? Sure we can. Their heart was missing in doing the ceremonies. We come to church, we sit down. Is that, a cer do you, is that ceremonial for some of us? I don't know. I hope not. But it could be. I was in the Catholic Church, and that we did. We went there, listened to blah, 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 blah and... You go home, and I did something today. That was a ceremony, no heart. And that's what Jesus Christ is trying to push in the books of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Jesus Christ was, we know that he was certainly, uh, uh, Galatians 4 says, God set forth his son made of a woman made under the law. So Jesus Christ had to follow that law uh, perfectly. And he was, um, he grew, of course, and af after um, being uh, circumcised, etc., they brought him up according to the law. Luke 24, 44. I'll read it for you. It says, And he said unto him, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which are written in the law of Moses, and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me, he's talking about. Jesus Christ says the law, the Psalms, and the prophets, that consists of what? The Old Testament. And he says all that was written, and that was me back there, they were writing about. That's what uh, John 5, you'll read that, that's what Moses wrote of me. If you would have believed Moses, you would have believed me, my words. Let's go right to um, Matthew 22. I, I'm, I'm, I'm trying to uh, fit in what I can that's relevant. Matthew, uh, go to Matthew 19. Matthew 19. And this is the young ruler. And 
in verse 16. It says, And behold, one came and said unto him, Good master, what good thing shall I do that I may have eternal life? He was looking at doing something, not faith in Christ. He was looking to do something. And he said unto him, Why call thou me good? There is none good but one, that is God. But if thou wilt enter into life, keep the commandments. All right, Christ fortifying his view on following the law and the commandments. He saith unto him, Which? Jesus says, Thou shalt do no murder, thou shalt not commit adultery, thou shalt not steal, thou shalt not bear false witness unto thy father and thy mother, thou shalt love thy neighbor as thyself. And the young man said unto him, All these things have I kept from my youth up, what lack I yet? Jesus said unto him, If thou be perfect, go and sell that which thou hast, give to the poor, and thou shalt have treasure in heaven, and come and follow me. And so where's your heart? After your money or after me? What are you going to follow? I know on that, uh, I'm not real good with it, but Facebook, I learned something from my wife about unfriending or unfollowing. And so I, I found out to unfollow something is, is better than unfriending, right? Yeah, I don't want that page on my, no, never mind. But, <laughs> but that's what, uh, uh, what do we do for eternal life? Forgiveness. And Jesus Christ says, go do the commandments. And so, he, again, he's talking about the law, righteousness within the law. Uh, I, need to get, I need to get out of Matthew for a second, just to finish up. Uh, you're there, Matthew 23. This is a classic. Then spake Jesus to the multitude and to his disciples, saying, The scribes and the Pharisees sit in Moses' seat. Moses' seat. Mo the authority that Moses has uh, uh, to give out the law, this is where the scribes and the Pharisees sit. They have that authority. Verse 3, All therefore whatsoever they bid you observe, that observe and do, but do not after their works, for they say and do not. Their heart is far from me. That we would call that hypocrite, to tell someone to do something and then not do it myself. But that's where he's going. But this one thing here, Jesus Christ with both feet, he's just saying, whatever they tell you, do it. But don't do as they do. I used to have this saying, do as I say, don't, not as I do. Mm -hmm. <laughs> that's what exactly what Christ is saying here. But do the law. The law is important. Skip down. Go with me to Romans chapter 10 again. It's, you know, it, it says there, For Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to everyone that believeth. 10-4. Anyone here ever have a CB in their, in their car? <laughs> I almost bought one. 10-4. What does that mean? That's it. Over and out. We're done. Romans 10-4. Try that in the book of Hebrews too. And uh, we won't go in there. But Galatians 2.21 says, I do not frustrate the grace of God, for if righteousness comes by the law, then Christ is dead in vain. Christ is the end of the law for righteousness. This is Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. Mama Lou John. Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. And Christ is the end of the law for righteousness to them that believe. And that's, that's faith. No doing the law, no doctrine here, healing the sick, cleanse the leper. Let's leave that back there where it belongs, under the Old Testament. And uh, that's where all that was taken from. Christ looked back there, says, this is good. This is what we're doing today. And that's not the end of it. He did go on, however, to teach his, uh, his 12 uh, apostles how to perform in the kingdom. In 1 Timothy, we've been going through Timothy with Brother Brandon, and I'm thoroughly enjoying that, the days that I'm here, <laughs> if I don't get snowed in. 1 Timothy 1.15, this is a faithful saying and worthy of all acceptation that Christ Jesus came into the world to save sinners, of whom I am chief. Howbeit for this cause I obtain mercy, that in me first Jesus Christ might show forth all longsuffering for a pattern to them which should hereafter believe to life everlasting. 
And we're here hereafter, aren't we? And Paul is our pattern, not the Gospels here, but grace. And we don't have time to get into all the different verses. 1 Timothy 1, 6. From some, having swerved, have turned aside unto vain jangling, desiring, desiring to be teachers of the law, understanding never, neither what they say nor what they affirm. Some people want to go back in here and start teaching this. We see them out there today, and I, I don't hate them. I hate the doctrine that they teach. Understood? I don't hate the Pope. I hate the doctrine that he stands for. I hate the ceremonies and all the rituals and everything. All of this just becomes something, doing something, without the proper, uh, proper doctrine and the proper attitude. 1 Timothy 4.1. I'll leave you with this. Now the Spirit speaketh expressly that in the latter times some shall depart from the faith, giving heed to seducing spirits and doctrines of devils, speaking lies and hypocrisy, having their conscience seared with a hot iron. Seducing spirits and doctrines of devils. Now, I've never been so harsh against people in other, I mean, they're believers. Some people, these people are, some of these are believers because it says they've departed from the faith. If I depart from this part of the board and move to this part of the board, what have I done? I've moved from that doctrine to this doctrine. And so I've departed from the faith unto the doctrines of devils. Can I get saved under the book of Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John? Better shake your head, no. I can be, that can make me wise unto salvation like Timothy, but it can't save me. There's no blood found. There's no Christ died for our sins in Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. He alluded to it. But he looted, he was going to die. There's no Ephesians 1, 7. In whom we have redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of sins according to the riches of his grace. Now maybe uh, if you're listening, maybe it's the first time you saw this. Maybe you knew, never knew that there was a difference, just thought everything was really great because this is Jesus Christ teaching and what would Jesus do? Okay, go try walking on water. That's what he'd do. <laughs> but I want you to, uh, together, all of us, just to remember what's back there, and it's the doctrine of devils if it's taught today. It was taught properly in time. It was the doctrine that they were supposed to listen to back then, the nation Israel, and those that would come to the nation Israel. But for us today, Paul says in Romans 3, but now... Someone one asked, once asked me, when did the church, the body of Christ, begin? I says, I'm not really sure, but I know where it started to be taught. Romans chapter 3. And it's there, but now, the righteousness of God without the law. I can't know what it is unless I'm taught what are the context of it. And so that's, uh, Romans 3 is a wonderful section. For as many as are of the works of the law are under the curse. For it is written, Cursed is everyone that continueth not in all things which are written in the book of law to do them. If you don't do all of the law, you're guilty of all. But Christ has redeemed us from the curse of the law. Let's pray. Father, we uh, stop now. Uh, thanking you for your word. Thanking you for um, the spirit of God within us that helps us to understand your word and that understanding that we we see that we need to believe that Christ died for our sins to have eternal life and I'll offer a moment right now of quietness that if anyone's out there that was tangled up in Matthew Mark Luke and John father that we pray that their understanding would be open to understand that Christ died for our sins And that one day, upon believing that, God takes you and seals you with his spirit. In Christ our Savior's name we pray and ask these things. Amen.